Part of the reason that women are more likely to be in the labor market is that fewer of them are marrying and they have less faith that those marriages will be long-standing. So part of the positive poverty decreasing change is related to these family changes. More women working is also related to these changes in relative earnings. And less marriage and more work is also related to fewer children. And you'll see I have these double-sided arrows because, and some of the best work on this is done by people in this audience, there's a lot of debate about which direction the causality goes, um, which is another way of saying it goes both ways. <laughs> um, so for this final thing, fewer children because there's less marriage and more work. Well, are people having fewer children because they need to get back to work? Or are they going back to work because they're having fewer children? Well, it's, you know, everybody has a different story, but those two things are connected. So one reason why we can't just flip a switch and marry everybody and then it would be just fine is that lots of other things would flip at the same time. The bigger reason is we don't have a switch to flip, okay? So policy, you know, as a policy person, I'm all into where are there levers? Where are there things that I can change? And while there are things we can do on the margin, and while I usually don't like to make predictions, I'm quite happy to say, I don't think there's anything out there that's gonna reverse that green line to 40% non-marital children. Okay, maybe something really revolutionary will happen and it'll go to 35. That wouldn't be my guess, okay? But I challenge anybody to come up with something that's gonna make it be 20%. So if we're, and I would guess that it's more likely to be 50 than 30, 10 or 15 years from now. And so if we're gonna have more and more children living with just one parent and relying on one parent, we really need to think about how we're gonna change policy to make the environment that those children are in be one that is gonna provide them with the resources that they need to grow up so that they can be healthy and take care of us in our old age. So, what does it mean to design policies for what I call this new reality? Um, I think two elements of that new reality that we need to pay attention to are the reality of working parents. And I think that's a phrase that we don't think about enough and we really have to focus on both parts of that. These are people who are workers. They have to meet their obligations as workers and their parents and they have to meet their obligation as parents. And we have to think about what we're gonna do to make that possible. Um, and then we have to think about the reality of non-resident parents. A lot of parents are not gonna be living with their kids, that's mostly fathers, not as much today as it used to be, but we have to think about that. So, policies have to recognize that we have working parents, and we have to make it possible for those parents to meet both sets of obligations. Um, so few children, even preschoolers, have a full-time parent at home. Um, working mothers are the key to economic growth, so if you took out the increase in women's earnings, the expansion of consumption in the United States over the last 30 years would largely collapse. I mean, so a lot of our increased living standards, at least in terms of money, now, you know, our measures talk about money and they don't talk about time, and that biases what we count. But still, if you look at kind of our economic prosperity, a tremendous amount of that is not just at the low end, but also in the middle, is driven by increases in women's work. So we need that if we're gonna, given our economic model.